Hey, awesome. Let me introduce myself first. I'm Abby Linick. I am the marketing assistant here at La Jolla Learning Works. Um, and I'm excited to welcome you guys to our latest webinar, The Good Fight, Advocating for Your Child's Learning Needs. Um, here we're joined by fellow La Jolla Learning Works parent, Danielle Ward-Hines. Um, she's a mother to two boys, Rush, who is 10, and Cash, who is six. Um, she left her job in the hospitality and education industry after years of observing the way her children experience educational environments. She was determined that she and her husband, Phil, could do better. So she and Phil assembled the best support ne network of experts and got to work. And today, she's here to share that information with you all. So give a warm welcome to Danielle. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, I hope that it helps as many people as I'm, you know, I'm just a mom like other people. I'm just a parent. I'm, I have a full disclaimer that I have never done a webinar before. So let's all be gentle and kind. And I'm just here really to hopefully help others do the same thing we're doing. We've all been in the position where we're fighting for our children and um, we feel like we're hitting a brick wall and nothing's really getting done or being done. Um, you'll see that's Rush there laying on the trampoline. Uh, we have two trampolines in our front yard that keeps our kids very entertained and gets a lot of those wiggles out. Um, and then that's my whole family there. So we kind of do a lot of things together. We're super silly, we're super fun and uh, really supportive and don't think that we would be as successful as we are with what's happening with our kids if we didn't all just kind of lean in and take care of each other. So like yourselves, I have terrible days and I have good days <laughs> and everything in between. Um, this is really about improvising. Like everything we're doing is total improvisation uh, with the support of some wonderful people that kind of play their roles and are willing to back away when they need to and willing to lean in a little bit more when we ask them to. So I wanted to read a quote to kind of set the mood uh, for why we're here and what we're trying to do. Um, this is by Emily Dickinson. It's hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings a time without the words and never stops at all. And anyone who's been a special needs parent or even just a parent or an educator or has really enjoyed uh, what they did for a living and found their passion uh, the biggest thing is never, ever give up <laughs> and just keep going and um, take the good with the bad. So that's kind of what we're doing. Um, as Abby said, I'm a mother of two. I uh, had two very difficult pregnancies. It wasn't easy to get these kiddos here. They're both survivors and fighters. Um, and I think that's a tribute to our family legacy is that we will survive this. We will fight this. Um, and we really wanna put that in our children's hearts and souls that even though today is hard or we feel like we didn't have the right teacher or we had a bad experience, um, there is support out there. And so this is our team, Team Rush. Obviously my family is the original Team Rush, but we had some people in the last two years and we've been really uh, lucky to have Dee Dee there. Um, she's our advocate. She's been with us for almost six years advocating for Rush. And also for cash, because um, cash is neurotypical, but needs some help because of everything he's seen his brother go through. He's not exactly excited about the school experience. And I'm sure a lot of you have the same things going on. Um, this is Miss Deb. She's our occupational therapist um, next to the pool there, which we have a pool in our yard. We set up every year. We find that great to help with regulating behavior. Uh, we had the pool set up this year all the way through mid-December. So if you can imagine, um, it was ice cold, but somehow it helped uh, to calm nerves and calm energy and to give Rush a sense of purpose. And he liked the idea of floating. I'm sure a lot of you have found over the years that your children are swimming. Uh, it's been known that it helps special needs kids, especially autistic kids with the way that their bodies feel in the water. So we encourage that. And because of the pandemic, we had to get creative. So we put a pool in our ear <laughs> that we kept up. And we'll be going up probably in March or April again of the year. And that's the way that we keep our kids happy. Um, both kids love it, but Rush especially. We'll go in it three, four times a day um, for small blocks of time. Uh, this is Rush and Cash. We do things like that all the time. We're using um, different materials to build. This is a set that you can get online through Amazon. Uh, I'm happy to share any of the resources you see in these pictures with you guys at a different time. Abby will be giving you my email. I'm open to questions now, later, 
as the weeks go on and you say to yourself, wow, that was something kind of cool I saw that she was using or that, you know, seemed kind of like my kid might like that. What, where do we get that? These are stepping stones. You can also get on Amazon. They're Amazon, they're squishy. Uh, so when you step on them, they don't move and yet they cause them to use muscles in their feet and legs and coordinate. And we make obstacle courses all throughout our yard. You'll see on our fence, we have lights. We have our whole entire yard lit year round. So our kids go outside whenever they need to and however they need to. And sometimes that's a scooter ride, sometimes they're jumping in hula hoops, sometimes that's swimming, um, sometimes that's doing yoga as you see them doing there, uh, whatever it is. And we really, really do try everything <laughs> and anything. Um, so, you know, what I would tell parents is it's just one step at a time, really. It just kind of find something, grab it, and then try. So right now we're currently using uh, an occupational therapist, Ms. Deb, where we're using Ms. Taylor as a resource and she meets with Rush five days a week, uh, one hour and 50 minutes. And she's a teacher at La Jolla Learning Works. That's how we met this wonderful program. And she's doing what's known as educational therapy. So Rush is not actually enrolled in a school. He's really just using a one-on-one -on -one tutoring support, but he does the same amount of work that children do in a full school day, he'll do that in two hours with Ms. Taylor. And then I send her these kind of photos that you're looking at uh, throughout the day or when we're working on the other side of the screen so that all the therapists can kind of see what's happening through a Zoom screen from the other side. <laughs> and what we're dealing with, I work with Rush and I go to school with him every single day or my husband does. Um, we're always hands-on, putting weighted blankets on people, uh, putting timers on, telling the teacher if we think they, he needs a break because we're not getting anything accomplished, or if he's moving really fast and he's into it, we encourage that and we say, let's go for it. I'll be texting Miss Taylor while she's working with Rush. She'll send me information back. Um, this is my family doing yoga because Miss Deb, our occupational therapist, is also a uh, action-based learning and a yoga trainer. So incorporated all those things together and we're really doing something quite creative in that when we need to regulate our bodies we're getting up we're doing brain breaks we're doing yoga poses we're doing breathing techniques um, all of which you can find online and then our other piece is musical therapy and we've been doing that now for two and a half years um, in order to do musical therapy you'll find that you will have to do an assessment a lot of musical therapists only work with districts we happen to luck out and have started off with them working with the district. And then when we went on our own and started doing this program, uh, we are the only client of Coast Musical Therapy that is getting to work one-on-one -on -one with a musical therapist online because of the kind of therapy we're doing and they want it to be part of it. So they really allowed a special uh, stipulation on there to kind of let us be part of this. And they're responsible for ordering all of our um, musical instruments, which we have everything from a glockenspiel to a tom-tom drum, um, you name it. If we're interested in a ukulele, keyboards, we bring those out and we rock out all the time. Uh, the musical therapists are doing more just working with Rush about how to learn about music. They actually are doing like full-on therapy with Rush, where he talks yesterday, for example, with his issues he's having with his brother with the pandemic they've been each other's best friends but they're sick of each other too as most kids are experiencing and um, they've been quite isolated because rush has uh, heart disease and therefore we've been keeping him out of the school environments and doing the virtual learning is really working for rush right now because he doesn't have the the fear and anxiety of going to a school and getting sick and then with the pandemic on top of that it would just be even worse for him so he is actually the healthiest he's ever been. He just had a wellness check last month. His doctor is very happy with his success. Um, and he says it's obviously something we're doing. And for the first time ever, Rush is positive about school, which is amazing. So you'll see Rush is working outside. These are his creations right here. Um, he uses number blocks, which you would typically only use for math to build. Those are birds, which is his passion. Uh, those are Legos that he he constructed and made into birds. That's all child student led. That's not anything that we're encouraged or doing on our part. That's just leaving materials in different areas and letting him go for it. 
Um, and then his brother as well kind of joins in and mimics that's what a little brother's supposed to do. But <laughs> um, this is a journal that him and Miss Taylor have been working on where they're building a history of just anything, basically research. For example, that's an Arctic turn and every day they add a piece of information. It gets Rush writing about something he's interested in, but it also is um, a, that he can go back, he can share with others. He can tell people what he's learning. We encourage him to do so to build his confidence. And it seems to be working really well. And it also teaches Miss Taylor some things. She always says, she always laughs at us and says, um, you know, I learned something new today too. And that's our goal. I think you should never stop learning even if you're an educator. So those are materials we're using as well. They're um, sight word swatting flies. So you can use a little swatter and you play sight word games with your kids on the floor. You learn time on the floor. These number cubes are unbelievably helpful. We've just added ones that actually are words, full words. Um, and Cash built some for you guys so you could actually see. So Rush and Cash Hines. And the red ones are your vowels and the blue ones are your um, consonants. And so it's kind of teaching them a double dipper. <laughs> but we also just added the ones where they're actually words. So you got children. So now we can start using those to build sentences and school and start to use all of the tools and things where you have a student like Rush who went from um, not even knowing his letters last in September of 2020 to now he's reading. So obviously what we're doing is kind of working. <laughs> um, does anyone have any questions so far? You want to throw any questions to Abby and she'll throw them my way and I'll just keep chatting. And if you want to share anything or you're interested in what we're talking about or, you know, something sparked an interest for you, please share. Yeah, and feel free to throw it in the chat. I'll tell you what. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, anybody can open up the conversation. I'm perfectly happy to share. Obviously, I wouldn't be here if I was in an open book. That shows Rush right there in that picture uh, with the log. That's actually a log we got so he can have optional seating. So he sits and perches on the log. He calls it perching because he also thinks he's a bird. And we encourage that because just because he wants to learn on top of a log or sit on a beanbag chair, which was the thing he was sitting on with his weighted blanket on his lap doesn't mean that he's not going to learn or that he's not going to participate. And we've all been in a classroom where the teacher says, sit down or don't do that, or you're, you're being too rambunctious. And I don't understand why kids can't learn under a table drawing if they're willing to do the work. And so that's what we try to encourage here is we have, um, we have an iPad that he learns on every day and it actually has a keyboard on it. So he could flip it around and he can control it. He could type in if he wanted to, or he can just look on the screen with Miss Taylor. And that's how he's learned for almost two years. And he's never met Miss Taylor in person, if you guys can believe it. And uh, he has never met uh, our musical therapist in person. He's only met the occupational therapist one time. And we're still having this level of success, which shows that you really can you can make it work. It can, it can work for you. It can work for your child if you're willing to just try everything. <laughs> and that's what we're going to keep doing. Um, this is a, we were learning about Martin Luther King for, for um, you know, Black History Month and Ms. Taylor had an idea. And so we started this project and we're going to actually have a whole Black History wall. And so this was the project that my children did. The one on the red is the one Cash wrote out uh, some words that he was liking that he picked off of what we put out and then those are the quotes that Rush enjoyed. Uh, this is an example of where Miss Taylor's doing a actual, it would be a spelling test anywhere else, but if you say the word test or quiz, as you know, most of our kids will freak out. They don't like assessments and like tests and like quizzes, but the way she does it is she just has a word review of his sight words for the week and that's how they do it online. Um, so it kind of is really amazing that we're doing this and that we're able to pull this off. Um, that's a magic tablet there. This is us preparing for our Valentine's Day party. Um, Rush and Cash earned a virtual Valentine's Day party. And we try to do things like that, that you would be doing inside of a classroom so that we can celebrate what they're accomplishing. And it's not always just work, work, work. Um, 
but we did a science experiment uh, where we put candy hearts in, you know, oil, vinegar, and soda. And we've all done that at some point. Um, and then we went back and forth throughout and they would report to Ms. Taylor what they're seeing. They had to draw what they saw. Um, this is them. We had popcorn and Rush literally dropping the mic over there in the corner because he's so excited <laughs> and happy. We played a math game where you use the hearts to count up how many different ways you can make the number 10. And they had to report that to Ms. Taylor. That's what you see Cash drawing there. Um, those boards are called step boards. And they're really good for if kids, if you've ever been told your kid has poor hand strength or that they don't like, um, I, can't, I can't understand why they don't like chalk or they don't like pencils or it's all about the kid's fault. They just haven't tried hard enough to give you enough different materials to expose your child to. Our son was told for years that he has poor hand strength and that he can't um, write properly and that he was just being basically lazy. And what it turned out to be, my dad found this out, was he started letting him use little golf pencils because my dad was an avid golfer. And he started letting him use little pencils and he noticed that he was starting to draw and write everywhere. So if they were at a hotel, he'd just start scribbling numbers. Uh, he'd watch like what was on the phone and he would draw those numbers on a pad of paper. We're using the little pencils though, but not any of the materials that he'd ever been given in school. So we started introducing like super tip markers, dry erase pens. Uh, we just started changing the materials he was exposed to. And what do you know? He suddenly took to it and now he's doesn't have an issue with writing or drawing. He feels very comfortable with it. We use um, these like these clicky pens, but they're colors, they're fun. Um, we use the fat markers too that you all have in your homes. And what I do is I have like these little trays, like they're party bladders. And I put all the materials in there and just put them in the middle of the room and then see what they gravitate towards and whatever they go for, that's like, okay, cool. That's what, how you wanna do your project or that's what you wanna do or that's interesting to you. Okay, great. Like Cash today had to write his name. Well, this is how he chose to do it. He wrote it one time and then he used stickers and then he wrote his full name on the bottom using markers just to like show that he could do it three different kinds of ways. And everything we do with Rush, we do with Cash. So sometimes Cash will even sit in with Miss Taylor and that gives Rush a peer, which is what you would have in school. Um, so don't be afraid to ask the providers and the people helping your children to switch it up or do something different they might not have wanted to do or maybe your brother the brother or sister in the room isn't the actual student but guess what it's encouraged that they would be talking to their peers in a reading group or they would be sharing a project with their peers and having to give like a little speech and conversation so what's the difference if it's a brother or sister their mom or dad or their stuffed animals at least they're participating and they are trying to um, make themselves available to the education you know and that's the whole goal Hopefully that means a lot to people. I don't know. It's a lot of information. I get it. I do. I have a lot of resources that, you know, Abby's going to be given to you on the flyer. They're going to be available on the website as well. Um, and then the things you see in the pictures, I don't mind um, sharing any of those. Like I said, like, you know, if you want to know, like, what kind of marker thing is that? Or, um, uh oh, we got a question. <laughs> it's Miss Taylor saying. Oh yeah, so we do scavenger hunts. That's what she's saying. Talk a little bit about the scavenger hunts. Thanks, Miss Taylor. Love you. <laughs> she's the best. Um, we have been in order to encourage uh, writing, in order to encourage Rush to see things in real time. We do scavenger hunts in our home, and Miss Taylor will lead it. So she'll put up like ten things on the board, and she'll say like, "Okay, you have to go find something green." And then both my kids go running and scaring and looking and they'll bring it back to her. And then they have to find something that has like the ch sound in it or whatever. And that kind of, of course they're obsessed with Cheerios. So thank goodness for that. But um, they'll have to go find that item and bring it back and they get points for everything they're doing. And they also realize they're completing a task but it's like a fun task. And sometimes we go outside and sometimes it has to do with the theme of Valentine's day or um, Christmas time, we did a lot of things. So we had them write down things and then I put them all through the house and they had to find the words 
next to the actual item, like the word was tree and it was right next to the Christmas tree and they actually had to find it and cross it off. Like they were doing almost a word search slash scavenger hunt. Uh, and that's how we kind of create this really unique way of them diving in and learning and not being afraid uh, because that's a lot of what our children have dealt with, I think, is the fear. The fear of being bullied, the fear of being told you're not good enough, the fear of someone telling you you can't. And years and years of that, which Rush experienced for years and years, will devastate your heart. I mean, as an adult, I don't want to be told all the time I can't do something. I mean, that will really not only will make me want to do it, but it hurts your heart and makes you feel bad about yourself. And it, it, it leads to low self-esteem and different issues. And that's why we're really working hard with, um, we actually have music, occupational therapy and academics, Ms. Taylor, all those people talk to each other all the time through email and then they'll try something and then they'll go over here and they'll say that didn't work. What do you think Ms. Deb will give them ideas through the occupational therapy side of it? Um, music therapy will say, hey, let's try this. Uh, so Ms. Taylor and I ended up banging out using the drum. We would bang out the syllables to words is what we came up with. And we had them use the Tom Tom drum or the bongos like you see Cash doing here. And um, we found that it was very helpful for them to hear the sounds. And then Ms. Taylor started having Rush touch his chin so he can feel the vibration of the word. And I noticed that he started doing that all the time. It went from like him not really paying attention and doing it for the first few weeks to suddenly he was doing it whenever he got stuck on a word or he wanted to read a bird book or see what kind of bird that was or whatever. Um, this was, our, that was the science experiment I was talking about with the Valentine's hearts. So they, they had their three hearts there and their three different um, liquids. And then we put it off to the side and then they would come back throughout the day and tell us what they were experiencing or what they saw that was different. And if their hypothesis was right, that it was gonna sink or float. Um, and just for the record, they all sunk <laughs> and they all melted together. That's what happens to candy hearts. Um, there's another example of Rush with his bird cards. So we bought him these bird cards and we started, uh, he knew all the birds already, but he started using the blocks to recreate the birds. And then he put them like that. And I came to the room and there was at least like 50 cards laid out with all these different creations of things on top of them, which is obviously very unique and interesting and not the usual way that you use number blocks. So um, I would tell you guys too, we use good old fashioned light bright. Does anyone remember light bright <laughs> like back in the day? And that was right. And that was the thing you'd be, you're right. You'd be sticking those pegs in trying so hard. Well, good news is, is they actually work better now. <laughs> so for like under 20 bucks, you can get your kid a light bright and the, just let them go with it. You know, let them have a go with whatever they want to create. So over Christmas time, Cash and I made uh, Christmas trees and like ornaments and we were using different manipulatives to make different things. And it came out really cool. And then another thing I do that a lot of parents love because parents, certain parents don't let slime in their house. Certain parents don't let putty in their house. Everyone's got, I don't want Play-Doh in my carpet. I get it. I do. But if you fully give into this, you will be happier and your kids will be happier too. So make shutterfly mats. That's what I do. This is my kids. I make them tons of shutterfly place mats and then for every messy gross thing they have to have a mat first and even if they use it on the carpet or whatever and it's helped a lot because it also shows them responsibility they have to return the mat after we wipe them down it's really just fully engaging them and getting them to participate you know so that I think is the most important thing how do I check the chat Abby do I just click on it yeah if it's at the bottom or can you click on it yeah we got it uh, no questions so far. <laughs> no, it's okay. People are talking to me about like, just they're appreciating what they see. So that's good. Um, and I wanted to tell someone, everyone, the reason why we started doing this and what really inspired me the most was we went to uh, what's known as mainly Mozart and hopefully they'll start having their seminars again. Uh, pandemic obviously has caused a lot of issues with things being delayed, but mainly Mozart occurs right here in San Diego. And what it is, is a celebration of music and art. And they have a lot of special educators come. Uh, these people came all the way from like Wisconsin and New York. 
and they give speeches and it's the best of the best experts in the business of autism, special needs. And they actually tell you things that are like mind blowing. Like everything starts with music and art, but most people, those are the first things that get cut in schools. And that's a problem for, especially for autis autistic or special needs kids. They really need that music and art, that sensory. Um, you see, we're building, we're making a pond there. We're built, we're, you know, we're in the ground, digging holes. Uh, kids really need that. They need to be able to touch stuff and be part of that. So when we went to mainly Mozart, we actually met Temple Grandin, who is amazing, by the way. Temple Grandin, I watched, talked to an entire line of 50 plus people and spent as much time as necessary with each parent or person that was asking a question. And you literally just wanted to hang on every word she was going to say. So when it was our turn, this is before we started this program and we were very frustrated with what was happening in the district and just, we weren't getting any answers and we literally didn't know what to do. She said, start with what he loves and immerse yourselves in that. And we're like, well, what do you mean? And she's like, what's your son's favorite thing? And I go, birds, he loves birds. He's a bird expert. I mean, he's using these big words. He can memorize bird facts. Um, it's amazing what he can do. And she said, everything has to be birds now. And I said, what do you mean? For example, get a clock that we found an Audubon clock that uh, chirps a bird on the hour. So it's a different bird on the hour and he knows the bird chirps. So he started learning time that way. And we still have it up to this day. And that's something we still try to use as a resource. And then she says, take him outside and let him see every time a bird comes into your yard and let him record that information somewhere so he can start looking at patterns of birds. That's how he's gonna learn counting and learning about recording information and get him as many journals and things, places he can write. And of course I thought it was crazy. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna do this, but I don't know how to do it. And I'm not sure how it's gonna go. So we created a bird sanctuary in our second yard um, next to our home when our landlord said, sure, we have this empty space and nothing's happening. We started putting up bird houses. We started putting up bird baths. We started recording birds and we probably have 50 or more different kinds of birds that visit our bird sanctuary. And that of course makes my son very happy, but we use it as a tool. So we got these bird journals, which you can get on Amazon and you can get anything your kid's interested in. They have those, but these specifically, um, Rush started recording his information and drawing his own bird pictures from, and this is how he taught himself how to write before we had this program or any program and he didn't know how to write yet. And he just kept doing that over and over and over until we got Miss Taylor. And then, and then we, we said, Miss Taylor, what do you think about this? And then she used that to make a bird of the day is how he would start his morning session. So it would say, good morning, Rush. Um, today's bird of the day is, and then he'd have to look at the picture and that led to conversation, which as we all know, if our kids feel comfortable, they're going to open up and they're going to be more willing to do the educational part of their day, the non-preferred tasks, the things that maybe aren't as interesting to them, or they're not really sure how they feel. And that's how she grabbed them from the first day. And then she built on that. And now they're at like, I think they did fish of the day. They've done Arctic animals of the, of the day. They've, they've switched it up and gone all over the place. And so it's not just him hyper-focusing on birds anymore. It's actually everything he can he's open to everything because he's had the time to be on stage and talk about the thing he loved the most and it was no longer seen as put those toys away don't do that um you shouldn't talk about birds 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 and instead of using birds as a tool the educators we were working with before were kind of missing that little piece there um and even the great therapists we had some of them just wanted to do it their way and were not very open and i hired every single person that's now working on our team and they were um, open. And I said that you have to be really open. Like, what, what do you think if we go lay in the grass? And of course this is pre-pandemic before we all had to really switch gears. <laughs> but um, people were honest, like if it was their thing or if it wasn't their thing. For example, Rush doesn't like to have a substitute teacher because he has a routine and a schedule and he knows what's expected of him. And when you have to stop and explain to a substitute all those different moving pieces or how Miss Taylor is able to improvise, it takes away from the time Rush will be interested in school. So we try not to do that, which I know is very hard for parents to understand. And 
you know, you go, oh, I want them to have education, but if it's not quality time with the teacher, um, then what's the point? So on those days, Ms. Taylor gives us lesson plans and she and I spend time every week planning and um, coming up with different ideas and different ways to use the materials we already have or to get new materials and resources that we feel like he's building up to. Like, for example, he's learning to read so much now that we've, we've moved on to these little readers and he's doing, he's doing these. And what we found was Rush wasn't really holding books in his hand to read because when you're in school, you naturally have those moments. So we kind of created it by getting him a copy of the reader and Ms. Taylor has a copy and they start off simply by looking through the pictures together and looking at what's happening in the pictures and then he'll read it. And when he masters the reading, he gets a sticker on a chart to show that he's mastered it. And part of mastering it is his ability and his willingness to read it to others, which is very hard for some kids on the spectrum because they're embarrassed, they don't have the confidence, they're not sure how they feel, um, and they're just really nervous about it. So this kind of builds up his confidence. So he read it to his brother. And we, we definitely counted that as you know him basically reading to a peer and we encouraged that behavior. So, you know, what works for us might not work for you. Um, parts of this will work for you. Parts of it won't. Um, some of this is obviously does cost something. A lot of it doesn't though. A lot of it is just buying a bunch of stickers and putting it on the floor with a bunch of art supplies you probably already have and just seeing how it goes and being open to it. Mostly, I, I'd say you have to be really open uh, and, and you have to have every person in your family <laughs> that's close to you that's going to be in contact with your children they have to be on board if not it's not going to work like if you have the grandparent that comes and is like oh my gosh what are you doing they should be in school or they should be doing this or they're not he's just slightly autistic or things like that that doesn't really help your family and that doesn't really set your child up for success and you really have to have those candid conversations away from your child where they can't hear, which is also the reason we don't think children should at this age be going to IEP meetings or anything that might be construed negative about their what they're doing and their skill set that can really uh, hurt and damage them. In fact, Rush accidentally, without us realizing, was at a few IEP meetings. We thought he was with the sitter outside and he heard the information and that's how he viewed himself for many years is what he was hearing about his skill set and his where he is in his age range and he's not over here and he should be doing this. And I would encourage you not to let your children have access to that at this age as they get older in middle school and up when they need to start advocating for themselves and really having a voice that's different. But exposing your children to a lot of negative talk about themselves is not great and I'm not mother of the year trust me I lose my temper I get <laughs> I say the wrong thing I eat a lot of crow <laughs> uh every day but I also am there for the hard stuff and I'm you know I go to school with my son five days a week I have quit my jobs and that's what I do that's that's my job now is to make sure that both of my kids are educated, not just Rush, but also Cash, and pick the best people who can support them and make them feel comfortable and who have good intentions, because intentions do matter when it comes to this particular topic, and that's how I really feel about it. Um, <laughs> that's cool. Someone said so cool. <laughs> um, we're also doing this, which I do recommend. It's um, a little spot of feelings and emotions. I don't know if you've heard about Diane Alber. She does the on the spot books and they're all about your emotions. It's a spot of anger, a spot of anxiety, um, sadness, happiness. And what she does that's so amazing is she gives you, uh, you can order stickers and then the stickers, are actually like feeling stickers. So they kind of work with their emotions in the moment, their emotions after the exercise, maybe they come home from school and they're really upset about something and you're trying to figure out like, what is going on or why are they so upset? And this kind of gives kids an outlet to just let it go. Like, I'm just gonna make this picture. And when you see like, why'd you pick those eyes or why is the face frowny? Or why is that face so happy? Like what happened today that I missed? Or what was so exciting about your day? 
And I always try to do like, what's the best part of your day? What's the worst part of your day? Um, Leaf, who is our musical therapist, just call that rose and thorns, which is a great way to make it a tribute really to any kid's age is a rose is beautiful and there's beautiful parts. And then the thorn can be ouch, it can be a little harsh. So what's the rose part of your day and what's the thorn part of your day? Um, or if there's something your kids are into, you know, like birds, for example, like what made you soar today and just feel like really happy, like you were flying. And then what kind of was like kind of bummed out a little bit and maybe made you go to the ground and you didn't really feel like having any bird seed and like what's going on, you know, whatever thing you need to attribute to get them talking about their feelings and Rush, Rush especially is really good about talking about feelings. And it's a little exhausting and it can be overwhelming, but <laughs> um, he's better than some adults about talking about his feelings. And we encourage that. And I, I cry in front of my kids. I laugh in front of my kids. I'm who I am in front of them all the time. And they know, they know when I'm having a hard time. Um, it's encouraged Rush to be more open to hugging, which is very hard for a lot of autistic kids, you know, and that's something that parents miss a lot is the touch because you'll have your neurotypical kid run up and do the, what you would consider to be the normal response. It's like, hi, I missed you, I love you, hug, hug, hug. Uh, and then you have your autistic child sometimes, sometimes they're nonverbal or sometimes they're like rush and they're a little standoffish at first, um, but they warm up. So I tell someone if they get a hug from rush, you should consider yourself pretty lucky because that means you're in. <laughs> he's, he's let you into his little circle and you should be pretty happy about that. Um, and that's really, something I encourage people to do is have your emotions right in front of your kid because in the end some especially kids on the spectrum they already know the emotion you're having like they're so in tune with other parts of their senses that we miss that they actually are picking up on it and they just want you to tell them this is fear this is sadness this is anxiety and this is real life like you're gonna have to experience these things and figure out how to manage all these feelings as you grow up and if you ignore them or you don't want to talk about them nothing will happen. Like you, you will just be someone who doesn't have any personality and you're just really miserable in your life because you can never be you. <laughs> um, so we encourage it and sometimes we regret it, but <laughs> we still do it anyway. <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, that's just really a lot about who we are as a family. Um, I can talk a little bit about our resources and what I Think people should have in their little learning kit of life. <laughs> um, basically, we have, you name it, we have it, which, you know, you see there. So the blocks are really helpful uh, because you're getting a kid to actually touch them and use them to manipulate things. So you're getting them to put their hands on it. And that's the way it sinks into Rush's brain. So sometimes Miss Taylor will mention a word and he doesn't quite get it and she'll write it on her screen and he's still kind of like, I'm not really getting where you're going and he starts to get frazzled. So then I'll help him build the word. Like those are his foresight words that he gets per week. Um, we use bubbles a lot, as you can see. Uh, we have, I can tell you the best bubble maker. I'll make sure to put that on my list for Abby uh, because we've gone through a lot of them and we finally found one that's amazing and you'll spend a couple bucks on it, but it will last and it makes that big of bubbles all the time. So bubbles are a big sensory yay for all kids, really. If you think about your earliest kid memories and blowing bubbles, it, you don't have any sad memories about bubbles. I mean, bubbles are like just a happy thing, right? Even as an adult, if you blow some bubbles, you see bubbles floating by, you think, oh, that's nice. And it kind of cheers you up or it gets you out of a funk. So uh, I think that's a beautiful thing. Uh, and it's cheap. That's one of the cheapy ones. <laughs> like you just grab a... We put bubbles in all of our cars so that when we used to go to the playground, we would always have a thing of bubbles and we always had a go-to if we went to the beach. We always had something for our kids to um, you just use to regulate behavior. I use a lot of timers. I was gonna tell people this. This is the best timer I've ever seen in my life. It's called the Time Tracker Mini. There's also a bigger one, but this one fits in any backpack. It fits anywhere you wanna go and you can set it for anywhere from five to 120 minutes, depending on the activity. Um, and you can also give them a caution. So that's what the yellow part is like. So if you're getting down to the wind down time, for example, and you have like a 20 minute time to be on the iPad at 
five minutes, it will start blinking yellow to remind them it's coming to a close and then it will blink red and you can put sound on and it will actually beep at them. Or you can just use the light if your kid doesn't like sound. So it's really sweet because it kind of does the best of both worlds. And it's a good way to regulate, like if you wanna leave the park. We're leaving in 10 minutes, everybody. And we already know about meltdowns at the park, not fun. Um, everyone's football held their kid under their arms and dragged them out of the park. Perhaps your parents did that to you at some point in your life. It's super embarrassing, it's humiliating. Nobody enjoys the experience. And then you're hysterical, your kid's hysterical. So this way it gives them ownership. And for my kids, if they don't bring me this when they're on their iPads, then you lose more iPad time. But if they bring it to me when it goes off, I might give them more time as a reward for being responsible. So I recommend this highly. I've just told my other friend who has two neurotypical kids because she said, I don't know what to do with this iPad time and all the screen time. And I told her the best thing you can possibly do is get a timer <laughs> because if you think about it, our whole lives are clocks, watches, alarms, timers. It works for them too. And it takes the responsibility off of you. So you're not chasing them around saying, my timer went off on my watch. That means you're supposed to be done with the iPad or you're supposed to be getting on to go to school now, or you're supposed to be doing this. You just hand it off. Or my favorite for all you parents out there that really go insane, especially in the pandemic where you're so fully accessible to your children and they don't understand waiting. I give them this now and I tell them five minutes when it goes off, that's when I'll answer your question. Because if not, you'll go nuts. And then they're, you know, Miss Taylor's seen it. We're talking. And then the other one comes and asks me a question while I'm trying to do school with Rush and Miss Taylor. Then I'm in music. Oh, there's, there's another one, something. Or I'm on the phone and I'm having an adult conversation. Next thing you know, somebody's with me um, in my adult conversation and they shouldn't be privy to the information. And they're taking bits and pieces of it. So this way it kind of like pushes them away, gives them time away, gives them a time when you'll be getting back to them. So they're not so frustrated that they're never gonna get to tell you. And that's something we're working on with um, the occupational therapist right now is just really being open to how do you get, especially an autistic child, especially the high functioning children who wanna share something so long, so specific, that 45 minutes later, you're like, okay, that was gonna be a quick story and now we didn't get to math or reading or whatever. <laughs> um, so we have a lot of editing and Ms. Taylor is my amazing guru at doing this with me. I'll say, Rush, just two more sentences or two more thoughts. And then she'll say, we'll come back to that. And the best thing about our awesome Ms. Taylor is she always comes back to it. She doesn't leave them hanging and she always remembers and that's why he trusts her because he knows that eventually I will get a chance to finish this story or I will be able to tell her this other fact or they'll agree to like, you do three problems, then you do three, then you get to talk about three birds or whatever it is. It's like a give and take and it's an equal partnership so that you can get them moving along and they don't hyper-focus and have a meltdown so bad that you miss all of your education time. Um, so I highly recommend you use that in every strategy <laughs> across the board. It's okay to negotiate a little bit, I think, if the negotiation works. Of course, there's times you're gonna be like, no, we're going to the doctor, it's happening. You know, we're gonna go to the dentist, it's it's on. But can we go to the dentist and then we can go to that favorite place to reward ourselves? Why not? We get rewards all the time. I, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I don't mind having a margarita to reward myself <laughs> for a job well done at the end of the day, right? So why can't they have something like that? And that's something we really encourage. Um, I would tell you guys that one of my most important things about this whole thing is that, yeah, we're doing this and it's amazing, but we're coming to a crescendo too, where we don't know how it's all going to keep going on. And we're not sure what the district's going to decide and things like that. And so we're having to be very open to keeping track of what worked for us, but also having an advocate still involved. Um, if you need to have lawyers involved, make sure you do your research and your homework uh, and let those people fight some of the fights that you maybe can't fight because you get to a certain point and we're just parents and caregivers who love our people who are just trying to help them and you get to a certain point and you feel frustrated and frazzled and you don't know what to do. Uh, I'm in a lot of support groups and I encourage a lot of parents. I give a lot of resources out. Uh, I can help anyone that needs to know about other things like IHSS, um, 
SSI, all those things that come with having a special needs kid. Uh, I'm happy to share down the road if you want to email me. I really mean it. I do respond. You can ask any of my friends. I'm really good about responding to text or calling or, you know, at least sending you back on Messenger the information you, you requested because I feel like we're a community and we should all take care of each other. And although we've been burned and we've been hurt and our sons suffered for years, uh, we're on the right path and we want to help other people to shorten their learning curves. So they don't have to go through the same things that we've had to go through. Um, I wanted to say too, that's Rush outside working because sometimes when he's having a hard time with allergies, he has a dust mite allergy and sometimes it's with the heat and everything, it gets really bad and he'll be having a bad day and I'll kind of, I'll text Ms. Taylor and tell her that. And then we go outside for school that day and he still works on his iPad with her and he still does everything that he would be doing in a classroom setting, but he's doing it in his own classroom setting. And we sometimes have better success. Or he's wearing the um, blue light glasses, which helped immensely. I know a lot of your kids probably have headaches from all this Zoom time and YouTube and everything's online. Um, I highly recommend that you try that and I'll also put that on the resources Abby and I will probably chat and get some of this stuff out on yeah because it's, it's a lot of information and it's a lot of cool stuff but it took a lot of it took years of research and I'm still researching ask Miss Taylor she's like where do you come up with this stuff and then we we just try it if it works it works if not we put it away and sometimes we come back to it a few months later and that's another thing is don't give up just stay just hang with it and just keep trying uh whatever works um I just encourage everyone. I mean, I just really do. I've had a, it's been a tough couple of years for us, but uh, we're making progress and we're here to share our story and we're really happy with the way the story is going. Uh, and when you find a good group of people, hang on to them for dear life. Like these people are like going to be at Russian Cash's graduation from high school, college. Like these are our people. They're, you know, they're never going to ever be not with us because they care about their success and that's what you want ultimately and be willing to be really vulnerable that's what i'd say we facetime with the occupational therapist and she sees the meltdown in the moment so she is a 24 7 occupational therapist for us specifically and she is available whenever whenever we need it because the kid isn't going to have a meltdown on tuesday at 11 a.m every time so real time is better for therapists to help kids and that's part of what I wish schools would figure out is rotate the times that, that the therapists are coming into the classrooms and rotate the times that they're having um, information with the educators because really kids need help at you know 11 p.m. <laughs> they need help at 9 a.m. They might need help on the weekend, uh, which is also something we do is we do school every day. We don't have a break. We go all year round and every day. So our kids have some form of routine so some kind of learning every day is happening, whether they have to read a story or whatever. And some things are fun and they don't even know they're doing learning. Um, and they, we, they don't even ask us like, oh, is that school? But they don't know what day is a school day and what day is not a school day. And I encourage you to get your kids that mixed up that they don't even know that they're actually learning something every day. Um, so those are just my thoughts. Um, and Abby, what do you think? <laughs> That was great, yeah. And if anyone has questions, feel free to unmute, um, put in the chat. I can read it for you. Whatever feels most comfortable. Um, email Danielle at a different time. Yeah, and I'm happy to get a list going of all the resources yeah. too. So you'll get the other list of free online resources, but the actual physical things we're using, um, I'm happy to kind of collect those in a list as well and share those with the group. Yeah. I don't mind. Sure. Um, any questions? <laughs> it's okay if you don't have any, it's a lot to take in. <laughs> I just hope it's encouraging and I hope it, you know, helps the people that think that they want to give up or that their kid's never going to get help or they're never going to learn how to read or, you know, the first time my son read, I, I definitely cried. And then when he started to become fluent in reading, I really, you know, it's amazing. Um, it's just really cool and have, you know, keep your people close to you, even your friends The one have one friend like Christine Hank, for example, thank Chrissy, you're awesome. She's my friend. She's been friends with us for years. Her son is also um, on the spectrum. And so we've been able to bounce things off of each other for years. 
and she comes at it from the behavioral uh, standpoint. So she's watched the growth of just Rush over the past however many years we've been friends, seven, eight years, and she's seen the difference in him over the last year and a half. And it's cool when someone else recognizes that in your child and can tell you, and you're like, you're not making this up because you were there with me in the meltdown, or you know what a meltdown is because you help kids with meltdowns all day long for your job, or your son had a meltdown. And um, that's what I encourage people to do really is just have those people close to you, uh, have your meltdown with them and let them know that this isn't easy and you're scared and you're tired. I called her earlier and told her, I, I didn't know what I was going to say. What if nobody cares? You know? And she says, just say what, just talk from your heart. And so I hope that's what you guys got from this. Really. That was my point was to just really speak from my heart. And I, I really thank Megan because she's the one, the director of Loy Learn Works, because she's the one that asked me like, what are you doing? And oh, this is so cool. We want to be part of this. And I do appreciate all the organizations that, you know, stick with us no matter what and who encourage us and uh, let, let me have a platform like this to talk on. I, I really do um, think it's beautiful and I'm very flattered, so. Awesome, and we really appreciate you coming and speaking as well. I'm sure thank that you. I love the resources. Thank you, and thank you for all the kind comments. I see people saying thank you and I, I really appreciate that. It